the internet i'm not on that place <laughs> you know what i'm actually doing right now is like like unironically i'm paying my power bill oh that's good no yeah like you think i'm kidding but i'm literally clicking through it it's 147 dollars and 69 cents anyway damn um as always <laughs> welcome to pleasant evenings book club my name is hannah i'm joined by roberto and corbin you want to say hi guys uh, hello, this is Roberto. Hi, this is Corbin, obviously. Thank you for joining us for another pleasant evening. That's right. Uh, so today we have been reading the, um, oh, and I'm forgetting his first name, the Aikman story, Into the Woods. Um, it is an interesting story about a British woman who is in a Swedish forest. Um it's very heavily hit upon. <laughs> um, yeah, that's like, not much happens. That's definitely one of the main things that happens. Right. Robert Aikman. I, I, it was, I knew it was that or Roger, and I really didn't want to say Roger, so I'm glad I looked. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I looked. Uh, <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought Roger but yeah. is Robert. What? I, yeah, do you want to elaborate on that? You know, like, like Jack is John. Jack is John? Yeah. That's true. Well, so my... my well, actually, that's not quite true, because my uncle goes by Jack, but his, his, tr- his true name is Jacob. Jacob. Yeah, but I then... When, maybe they share. But then another Jacob that I used to know uh, never, for example, went by Jack, so it's hard for me to... I guess I could go everywhere. It was, um, like, I guess, I guess, um... Uncle Vanya, whatever his mm-hmm. name is, like they call him Jean sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Jean is, Jean is John, right? Yes. Is is Vanya sort of the Cyrillic John? Is that what I'm understanding? <laughs> oh, what was his first? Maybe his first name was more like Janovich. It was Ivan, wasn't it? Ivan. Ivan is Jean. Where'd they get Vanya from? <laughs> we read this we should know <laughs> i think like as far as names like we i remember we'd like just made a decision to just stick with whatever word right the one that's like the most commonly used i think was our yeah was our play. anyway i i i think i i think uh it was Roberto's going to generally take a crack in the summary, but we're all going to weigh in a bit because it's a, it's a, it's full of twists and turns, just like the paths in the forests of Sweden, evidently. So, so, the, oh. so there's that. Yeah, it's beautiful. You want to get started? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think we're, I think we're, I think we're about there. All right. Um, yeah, so like part of it is that like yeah, this is a story where like not a lot happens, but it feels like there's like are a lot of important details or clues. I think there's like a thing with like any Robert Aikman story trying to retell it is like trying to like trying to like tell someone about a dream you had and you just know you're getting some details like some details wrong. Like no, it was like when it happened, it was very important. I, it's it's something about his prose too. I, I was kind of like it took me actually a minute to adapt to that. I don't want to like cut you off, but yeah, I think no, that's like no. Worth mentioning. <laughs> he'll like phrase things like and like he'll do like double negatives and like these like nested clauses and parenthetical statements. Yeah, and he'll always take the long way to get to 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 well, describe anything. And he'll make kind of obscure references and leave you on your own. Like, there's, like, a lot of untranslated Swedish in this, you know, just single words. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, yeah, figure it out. There's no footnotes, at least in my copy. I don't know about your guys's, but... um, No, not for me. So you're just kind of like, you know, I'm looking up all these words and concepts, (laughs) you know. And, well, yeah, I'll let you continue. I I, I was going to say something i was thinking no i think that's i think it's great to start with like uh like the, the sort of flavor that like the story has in his yeah. use of language he'll like make a obscure reference or he'll like um 
kind of just like imply an observation about something and just be like, uh, she did this as people who are nervous on Tuesdays typically do. <laughs> like just like, <laughs> like very specific kind of right ob- observations about people. Right. Or like, um, it, it took me a minute, for example, um, like, you know, before I'd really adapted to his style to sort of figure out, you know, and I think we'll get into this, so I won't spoil it, but like what her husband does for a living, because the way that he describes it is just so shifty. You know yeah. what I mean? I was like, wait, what does he do? Is he, He's what exactly? Like, it's okay. Yeah. Like, like, <laughs> He's got, you know, he's, the writing is like he's got large things, and he, you know, and he 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 moves dirt, and I'm like, you know, I mean, it's like, what what are you talking about? <laughs> but, yeah, <laughs> and he goes like, well, yeah, he he's like not like Marx or Hitler, so okay, so did, it's not either of those. Okay, yeah, okay, <laughs> that's that narrows it down. <laughs> Seems very oh, Victorian right. era way of speaking i guess yeah it's definitely maybe a very british thing right it definitely adds to that dreamy quality like i feel like i'm in sort of this this fairy world from minute one like a for, for from the second like you you set foot into the story you're, you're sort of like um you know you're on magical ground just because everything's described so fancifully yeah yeah, like I guess like it starts like I, like so that's like where it's tough to like make a I I'm I'm not just st- I am stalling I guess um but uh he doesn't start telling the story he like first just makes an observation about there being magical places right or, he does I forgot about that actually then they go so like the story I guess I'm gonna kind of run through it if there's any details um I'm missing or getting wrong. You know, feel free to stop me. <laughs> Our main character is uh, uh, Margaret Sawyer. People tend to call her Molly, even though she actually doesn't like that. Um, which I guess is like a bit of uh, foreshadowing or just like a little bit of um, like flavor getting into the idea of like ah, how maybe she isn't fully comfortable in like the life that she's living. Margaret Sawyer and her husband Harry are in Swiss are in Sweden. Uh, they're in this small town called Sovastad, somewhere off of Stockholm, because her husband is working there building a, a road. And she gets kind of like she really gets to know the town because her husband Harry is very like keen, he's very anxious about her fitting in with the other with the wives of the other businessmen, she she was being you know chaperoned, taken around by these very kind, uh, posh Swedes. And when they're going on this trip, they drive past this. Uh, they go up a mountain, and in the woods, they see uh they see um an out of the way kind of a, a hotel. They kind of ask about. She asks about it, and they don't really give her much information. They just say that it used to be a sanitarium, but it's also a hotel. And people don't really go there often. Uh, and it, it leaves an impression on her. As she's driving, like, just the woods themselves, like, she's she's getting these thoughts about how the woods maybe have some kind of power in of themselves and how um, she noticed that they don't really have a lot of, a lot of trails usually. Like, they're, they're, they're very good at keeping out, I don't know, civilization, society, and have their own power maybe because of that. Yeah, but she's left thinking about it. And when her husband... Uh, Sester that she had that he has to go to Stockholm to I don't know figure out some business stuff for two days. Um, she she asks him. She says, "Hey, can I, is it okay if I actually stay in this sanitarium for those two days? Um, I want to see what it's like. It seems it'll be more chill." She's kind of um tired of all the Swedish wives and and Sovastad in general. So I think she also wanted like a change of pace. I guess they figure it out. They kind of, they cut to, like, once she's already checked in and she's waking up from a nap, which she doesn't, which she hardly ever does, and she goes out to, to lobby, I guess, and it's it's very empty. It's very beautiful. She describes the way that the light comes in from these windows and the, the way the, the banister is, like, being held up by wood nymphs and how there's a stained glass with wood nymphs on it, too. And she's uh, just kind of exploring. She sees there's no one at the desk. 
and yes, yeah, practically empty. She's and and she when she's looking out, she sees that there's some there are some forest paths like um off the side of the road near the sanitarium. And she sees a woman come out of there. This woman takes it upon herself to be her to be Margaret's guide and friend. This is Miss Slater. As as her pre- you know, as, as the story progresses, like Margaret gets more and more annoyed with her presence in general. There's just something very um forceful about about her demeanor. Uh, I guess we can talk about like how she's annoying later. Um, but <laughs> she's the one who explains to Margaret how this is a sanitarium for people with insomnia. But like true insomnia, she talks about it at this horrible condition. Like I guess part of how she's annoying to Margaret is the way that she's always kind of self pitying about her insomniac condition. Yeah, it's people who really, truly don't get any sleep. Apparently there's like degrees of this insomnia condition. It could be very, very little sleep. She loves to expl- to, to woman explain about the physiology of what sleep is for. We get some details kind of about about um, sleeplessness and like what that what that means to be part of that. Apparently it's more common in Sweden. Maybe that's explained later. I think like because she meets two people that kind of explain it to her and she gets more details as it goes. I feel like they kind of like mm-hmm. allude to the the way the sun is, you know, when you're that far north. Because sometimes the sun doesn't set. Yeah. I've actually seen both, uh, well. Like long nights and both. long days? Yeah, yeah. I've been to Alaska in both, uh, both extremes. <laughs> that would give you a different uh, relationship to to time and to sleep. and. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. There's a lot of like drawing the blinds and then like a lot of... Um, Making the most of the three hours that there's sunlight. <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> oh you know, yeah, yeah, on both ends. Um, yeah, you like got to think about what what you're gonna do in those three hours. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so maybe that has something more to do with it. But like, the sleeplessness right. isn't um, endemic. It's def- It's a thing that like it seems to um, also kind of mark you as an outsider quickly. People with the insomnia condition become unbearable to be around to, to, to the sleepers. That's what she calls the people that aren't insomniacs. Normies. Normies. <laughs> yeah. Um, but over time, Miss, uh, Margaret gets so kind of annoyed with, uh, with Miss Slater's like, uh, um, insistence on having tea all the time and just being around all is that she decides to check out early, but she finds out that she can't, um, because, there's no taxis that go there past 4 p.m. or something. So she she's resigned to kind of be stuck for a night at least. And she manages to extricate herself from Miss Slater to go out on a walk into the woods alone, kind of how Miss Slater came out of the woods. Miss Slater, yeah, Miss Slater like, offers to guide her because she says that, that it can be difficult alone, but she, she really wants to do this alone. And she goes into the woods. And it's a really great description, like this whole episode of her going out into the wood. Where it just like kind of awakens something in her as she sort of connects to the sort of rhythm of the sounds of the woods and I think they refer to it as like an altered perception a couple times, I think. She has like a yeah. you know, it creates a state of mind in her almost. Mm-hmm. And here's where it's interesting where I'm sure Robert Aikman would be capable of simply um depicting the state of mind, but he does just outright say that that she becomes more aware of, like, a way of seeing things that evades logic. Yeah. Gosh, that's so vague. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But I guess, like, that's where it helps to have this kind of circuitous language. It's I guess it's kind of like those, like those roads, like the, the forest paths. It started, they start out with these main paths, but as you go a little bit deeper into the forest, they, um they kind of start like um branching out and getting more winding around around the trees uh i think they're called what are they called rabbit runs oh yeah i remember that specifically no it was a very uh i I didn't i didn't know about it as a term before but it is very evocative yeah yeah i think i've heard it before it's just it's not like the kind of thing that comes readily to mind when i'm talking but like immediately i i I can picture it you know Mm mm-hmm and I think actually, like, going from the main road into the rabbit run is, like, where I... Maybe I'm 
in maybe I'm reading back into it, but I feel like that's where like the shift happened in her per in her perception. But she doesn't have like a lot of forestry equipment, so she doesn't get too far before coming back. She realizes that oh, actually, it can be kind of difficult. Like it would be very easy to get lost here if I don't have a, you know a compass or something. Right. Um, but she comes out and she kind of experiences the sanatorium again in a more appreciative way. I guess she was she was never against it, really. Just Miss Slater was kind of annoying, and she did really want to leave. But she talks about hearing the the kitchen staff making their noises and hearing someone sing in Swedish and finding that very beautiful. And she, they make a point of, or she makes a point to, like, notice or to, to note that... Um, the song is more beautiful because it's because it's not in English because it's more mysterious and like isn't affixed to any meaning right and so she now so she comes back to to the sanitary sanatorium torrentarium sanator what's the difference between those two one's things? a toilet i think yeah, well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think sanitarium. I think that's how the Metallica song goes. Right. No, they're the same thing. Or, yeah, but do I trust Metallica oh, the same to thing? get it right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Is it one I, a toilet? Same difference. No, shut up. <laughs> oh, I see. You're Oh, I guess like instead of calling it that, I should call it. Like, we it does have a name. The the Kurhus. The Kurhus. The yeah. Kurhus. Car um, car house. Um, it's called the full name. Ironically enough, is named after someone who slept for two hundred years. Yeah, the full huh. name is a Jalimachus. Jalimachus. Yabilicus. Yabilicus. Yeah, yeah. Yabilicus. There was like a whole little myth about him, wasn't there? I, I meant to look that up and see yeah. if it was from like real mythology, but I never did. I think it is. Yeah. Um, uh, Miss Slater explains that the story is told, is retold in 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 Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Um, she's also like, I guess this is the first sign that she's annoying. I, mean, I found a bit... Yamblichus was the one among the seven sleepers who, after they had slept for two centuries, went down into town in order to buy food, tendered the absolute coins, and found himself arrested. Don't you remember your gibbon? inquired Mrs. Slater, even more unexpectedly. You mean the decline and fall? I'm afraid I've never had time for it. And Mrs. Slater gazed, gazed at her. It's different here. But I knew about Yamblichus before I came here. He's the, Okay, so, okay so not, not so annoying. I, I guess like when she just asked, don't you remember your gibbon? Just feels so like, pompous to me. Right, I can't even imagine. Who the fuck is Gibbon? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just aware, like, I haven't read it. I'm just aware of it. Like, he wrote a, a history book about, you know, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. I think part of the thesis right. is he blames Christianity for it. And it was written in the 18th century. I've got the seven sleepers pulled up. Hold on. In the Islamic and Christian traditions, the seven sleepers, otherwise known as the sleepers of Ephesus or the companions of the cave, is a medieval legend about a group of youths who hid inside a cave outside the city of Ephesus around AD 250 to escape one of the Roman persecutions of Christians. Various schools of Christianity about the resurrection of the body in the day of judgment and life after death. A landowner decided to open up the sealed mouth of the cave, thinking to use it as a cattle pen. He opened it and found the sleepers inside. They awoke, imagining that they had slept but one day, but slept but one day, <laughs> and <laughs> sent one of their numbers to Ephesus, <laughs> Ephesus, I... I to buy food with instructions to be careful. Upon arriving in the city, the person was astounded to find buildings and crosses attached. The townspeople, um, for their part, were astounded to find a man trying to spend old coins. The bishop was summoned to interview the sleepers. They told him their miracle story and died praising God. The various lives of the seven sleepers in Greek are listed and in other non-languages at... B-H-O. 
Okay, so it's a real thing from mythology. The, yeah, that's just it's yeah, it's from Christian Christian lore. Man, Christian lore used to get so much more freaky. What a what a night, what a time. Oh yeah, yeah. It was it was like Dark Souls, but they they didn't even know it was dark. They just they were like, "This is just what life is." <laughs> yeah, just yeah. I was like, it's just tougher. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, it's kind of weird that they called this this um this place for insomniacs. They named it after the guy who slept for two hundred years. Just feels like rubbing it in. Right. Um, but they also, I guess, there's some something about like even they're these people aren't sleeping. Like they they're probably. Some connection to like whatever mythical like attributes we give sleep probably then get dispersed into their lives or the world because the woods around the sanitarium are also called Jamblicus Woods. Anyways, uh, where'd we lo- leave off there? Um, they're having dinner and like and she's and and Miss Slater encourages uh, Margaret to go to sleep. Uh, when it starts getting late, that's when most of the of the insomniacs start getting up. Um, like a lot, like a lot of them, they kind of compared to vampires. Sometimes, like some of them who are like more advanced in their condition, like just sort of rest in the day and come out at night. And that's when a lot of them like to go into the woods. Um, and like Margaret's actually like in her. Now that she's been awakened to, to some of the, to some of the gentle allure of like the the life of these people, um, she really wants to see these people do their progression of their pilgrimage through this trek into the woods. Um, but Miss Slater is very keen to 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 stop her. Like I understand why you would want to, but like bad things happen. Like don't go into the wood at night. Uh, please tell me you'll go to sleep. And she's like, I won't promise, but okay, um, I I hear you. And when she's going to go, um, she's going to go back to her room, like uh, this Polish, this old Polish military guy, like stops her. And he seems a lot more positive. He's not as uh, self-pitying about the insomniac condition as Miss Slater is. Like she'll talk about like, oh, we don't drink coffee because it, oh my God, it's so bad for us. And we don't, you can only imagine we don't drink alcohol because it's so you know it feels so bad to be drowsy but not be able to go to sleep. Um, um, but this guy, he's this guy's like um, he's not scared of Margaret. He like he's more uh, encouraging of Margaret going out into the wood at night. He he's uh, you know he uh, he gets her some coffee too. I don't remember if he actually drank any of the coffee or if he just had some to give to. Um, he talks about how he acquired the condition after having been traumatized in a war. And he talks about a jolt usually being what it takes to awaken people to some kind of truth. And that that's what being an insomniac is about. Um, they kind of have a nice conversation. He says something, he, like, he, he, uh, like, he's able to just jump into this and, like, give this advice because he's saying that since no one really talks to each other, it's a very quiet place. And, um, it, when I, you know, he overheard basically like their whole conversation, like just like noticed her going out into the woods and stuff, and he noticed in her this uh, uh, enthusiasm or this curiosity that that she is becoming more sensitive to to what he sees as something special about being an insomniac. He also talks shit on roads and motor vehicles. Based. Yeah, I actually I. He he did say some weird things about World War Two. Uh, that <laughs> yeah, were, he did. He did do that. Not not base. But when he said that um, roads are bad and that cars are bad and that that's what and they're as bad as Hitler, I figure I I it got me back on his side. Yeah, that was yeah that was ironically really unironically really cool of him. Like I I I, I was I was with him on that. Yeah, it goes to show. I always imagine people talk about, um, I always imagine people talk about, like, uh, like you know, cars and, you know, and roads eating up, you know, our urban infrastructure as, like, a sort of oopsie where, oh, it's just so convenient. And before we knew it, everything became strip malls and heat and alienation. 
but yeah. it goes to show that like where it was being built, like there were people who knew. Like I don't like Aikman. Like the story might have been from the sixties or seventies. So I guess like further into modernization. Oh my gosh! Even Vanya, like even Vanya. Yeah, true. Right. Yeah, all that stuff about <laughs> about destruction of the environment and like the cheapening of of modern life. Right. We've always had this like ugly relationship with. Like just you know, industrialization and its effect on the world around us. Right. Um, right. Like, like we use like Luddite as a bad term, but it turns out that like they were actually like a fairly well organized group that had a lot of like good points about what the, you know, what the machines were doing. And it wasn't just uh, like fear of technology. Right. Yeah. God. I mean, it's, a, it's tough not to, like, go into these things because, I don't know, part of the experience of reading the book is sort of, like, sitting in a page and then if, if a detail kind of hits you, sort of, like, sitting in that for a while. And it is just people saying opinions to each other. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, but getting back into the story, um, she's mm-hmm. emboldened by um, the Polish guy's advice to to try to go out at night. Um, there's also another thing that happens where um, earlier in the day she had... This is the part where... This is how it, it is, like, trying to describe a dream. Oh, also this happened. It was important. Um, nothing happens with it, but she notices, like, there's this, um, like, young... There's this young blonde girl that, like, she notices walking down the stairs one time who had these, like, uh, like very, like, blank blue eyes. And... She sees her again at night, and she's wearing a much more... Like, before, she was dressed, like, very plain. um, Like, in a way that just, like, obscured all her body and everything. And then she sees her at night again, when she's... Go- for, for, and she's going to go out into the wood. And she's wearing, like, uh... was like, a skin-tight black fabric. Um, She's kind of done up more, I guess. But uh, as she sees her... Yeah. Um... Um, this woman like looks back at Margaret for the first time she said instead of just having a black expression and Margaret swears she sees a little smile um, and she like thinks back to her later um, but anyway she goes out at night and she and she just for the first thing she realizes is like we see we, uh, we get uh, some exposition about how cold it is and how dark it is like she's like stumbling through chairs to get to to her old wooden path and as she gets into, um, like deeper into the wood, like the like she basically she's com- she compares the feeling to being like in inside of a block of ice. She goes from sh- shivering and chattering teeth to c- complete stillness. Like I guess she kind of makes peace with it. She does a little progress, but as she goes, she gets um like kind of scared about like getting lost because it is so dark. She realized like when she crosses, crosses, you know, passes some arbitrary perimeter, she wouldn't even have any of the light from the courthouse. Kurhus. She also expresses or like gets this fear of running into any of the, any of the real insomniacs. Um, but for whatever reason, um, she chickens out and she kind of like carries this shame with her. She goes back to her room to, like, she thinks about going back into the wood, but she doesn't. She just sort of takes a warm shower, goes to bed, and the next morning leaves the core host trying to avoid, trying to avoid everyone. She she wonders whether she'd be more ashamed to, to speak to see Miss Slater or to see the Polish man. Because I guess she did, like, not really live up to either of their expectations. Right. Um, she was, she like checks out, she takes her taxi to, um, Sovastad where, and maybe it's because, oh my God, you know, it's crazy. It's, we've been doing 45 minutes and we have not even done with the, <laughs> this might be a weird one. Um, it's kind of a long story to be honest. <laughs> yeah, know? true. Right. A long story where nothing happens. It's so like, why do I like this one? <laughs> I mean, I'll, uh, I'll be honest. Yeah. I liked it too. In spite of the fact that it's. <laughs> I was rather disappointed with uh, its end direction, ma- ma- uh-huh. mainly in Margaret Molly's 
decision to turn around. I thought there was a lot of build up involving seeing the insomniacs at night and it, it was Yeah, I did wanna I did wanna see. Yeah, but I guess we can discuss. Like, I guess, like, let's let's go into what happens when she turns around. Like, she she's back in town, and she attributes it to. She attributes it to maybe being without her husband this time, and she just feels like everyone's just very rude to her as she goes from hotel to hotel, and they all tell her that she's full, and like the only place she ends up getting a, a room is a, a Salvation Army hostel. Where she gets a horrible night's sleep. Like, when she goes there, also, they give her, like, some religious reading materials. She barely gets to sleep when she's woken up by the hostess at the at the hostel. Who offers to pray to her, even though she doesn't speak Swedish. And she's like, thanks, but no thanks. Um, right. <laughs> and she's like, okay, we don't force our... or whatever. Um, read this book called Purification. Um... It's like a weird, I don't know, like a weird episode. Um, she, yeah, part of, she attributes also part of the bad sleep to all the all the cars that are running through outside her window. And she thinks back to uh, our base Polish uh, officer talking about how cars are make, were making the world worse. Yeah, so she has a horrible night. The next morning she meets up with Henry again and they back, they're back to normal, basically. Henry, like, tells her all about, like, what it was like for him in Stockholm and, and all that. And, and, uh, uh, and Margaret just kind of lists, like, she doesn't really share about, like, what her experience was at the, at the sanitarium. He insists to her that, that maybe she go visit, um, one of the other Swedish couples. She thinks about doing it, ends up not really doing it, just sort of, like, sits in her room and thinks instead. And I think two nights in a row, one where Harry's making a lot of noise, another one where Harry's very happy because a business, like, a good business thing happened, and he's act- he's more sleeping more peacefully, she can't sleep, and she starts to realize that maybe she's, you know, she caught some of the insomnia, or, like, she starts, like, really fearing about it. So, um, over breakfast... Margaret like drops the drops the bomb. She comes out to Harry and she says, "I've been having a lot of hard time sleeping, and there's actually a place here that is for treating people who are insomniacs." Um, I kind of want to like find the like the last pages because this, especially like where like maybe like the specifics of the language kind of matter. Right. Um. But it apparently, but they don't go in, they don't have the whole conversation. They just say that it took, that it was, it felt like, um, like a breakup or something. Like it just, it was like a, like it was an argument. It took them like really talking it out to, for her to get what she wants to be able to stay in this place. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just read the last bit and uh, I think we'll like leave it there for uh, this protracted summary. (laughs) Uh, Right. The argument took every bit as long as she had expected, but Margaret was developing new resources now, even though she had little idea of what they were. I'll let you know immediately I get out of the wood, she promised. It's one of those things you have to live through until you emerge the other side. Mm. And that's how it ends. Yeah, that's... I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. It's an ending. Well, I guess let's start with Corbin. What was your... Let's talk a little bit about your point of dissension with this. What's your... Um, you know, your the issue. My big issue was that for most of the story, there was this buildup with first Mrs. Slater and then the Polish military officer about what occurs in the woods during the night with the insomniacs walking the path. And for how belabored or how how much build up it felt like 
was happening with it, that resolution for that specific scene of her just kind of standing in the cold for a bit. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I found myself disappointed in, in her turning around. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's consistent with her character. Maybe I, I feel a type of way about that writing choice. Um, Maybe a little non-committal or something. Yeah, it's um, just too restrained. I, I, I guess was my first impression of it. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, maybe maybe it was uh, indulged too much of the, in the in the British dryness. I, I, I guess my expectation and fine, fair. I'm not the writer of this. My expectation was that I was going to see <laughs> dream fulfillment occurring in in the waking hours of the night for these people. Yeah, I have. Um, if you want to go first hand, I, I have a thing. I'm just going to put this out, um, but I. I I'm just gonna say this as like not what I intend to say. If I ever sound like I'm sound, like I'm close to this, I'm. I think the cop out response to that would be, you know, uh, oh, but what could live up to the expectation? You know, leave things mysterious. Like I would. I don't want to like defend it with something. You know, with just like that surface level. That feels like a like a thought terminating. I mean, my idea. Mind you, the conclusion we we got yeah. was still good i mean ultimately she was navigating this uh these roles that she had previously had of being a good wife to henry but ultimately living a lifestyle she was ultimately going to grow out of i mean that that occurred so i mean there, there's some satisfaction yeah there. yeah like i there's some story I, in I, terms I, of like just her emotional journey I, yeah i think that's I think that's like most of it. I, I, I actually think we're supposed to derive more meaning from that than from her actual decision to go back. I There's one thing I kind of picked up on that I, 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 I didn't think was like super on the surface. But what do we think about the way that she dresses throughout this? Okay, so the first thing I thought of there was her insistence on like hiking gear and yeah, on yeah. not wanting to dress up. No, no, right, right, right. So that's, you know, she buys that whole hiking outfit, etc. It's all swagged out, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and that's because, again, she's been wearing these, these, these you know, moderate to high-end British lady dresses, I guess. I'm, I'm imagining floral patterns, right? Yeah, he implies, like, he says, like, um, that even hiking, for some reason, like, she felt pressure to wear, like, just short of, what the cocktail time shoes? Like, sounds like, like probably like something with a bit of heel which would would be horrible for hiking yeah 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 this is by her husband right so yeah. when she goes to this car house right car house when she <laughs> goes house. to the car house to the car house <laughs> yes she she brings her swagged out hiking gear with her right and at one point she sort of like talks herself out of wearing it i i believe it's around the time that she uh you know decides to meet with uh mrs slater for tea right yeah because miss slater um, wants her to dress up or like offers yeah, to yeah, yeah. lend her her frock so it's important to note that that's what she's still wearing when she does set out to walk in the woods and they make a mention of that there's like a thing where they mm. talk about how she like has sort of wobbles on her heel right I yeah. think that the reason she turns back is that she's still, you know, in some way, like, unprepared to, like, you know, transcend mm -hmm. herself. And, I mean, I, I actually think this, like, whole story is about her sort of actualization, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Because she, she, like, there, there is a lot of language about, like, feeling the weight of other people's expectations. Um, right. Al also, in terms of, uh, like, when she's there, like, one of the things she's the most afraid of is um running into one of the night walkers or one of the mm -hmm. insomniacs right like and that's all oh, that's purely a social anxiety thing right like like what could they do right it didn't well, like it really didn't feel like she was in danger i i think we see in the two people she interacts with sort of like a a um you know like a parallel for like the angel and the devil on your shoulder <laughs> you know 
there's this um, British lady, of course, who wants her to sort of <laughs> like like maintain as many trappings as possible of her life and her marriage, you know. And yeah. then there's this like valiant war general, you know, with some <laughs> maybe questionable ethical ideas that would have her, you know, drink the coffee and push out into this unknown. You That's know. Tr- oh my! Yeah, it's true. He gives her. It feels now that you say it, I feel it feels like I didn't even think about it. But she drank the coffee, and then after that, she can't sleep. Right, right. And I, I actually think the insomnia aspect of it has has like little. I don't, I don't actually think it's much of a story about insomnia, in spite of all of the you know Mrs. Slater's uh, you know <laughs> insistent moaning and shit. <laughs> Yeah, I I think the insomnia is like like sincerely a good thing here because it's um it's like her getting her like drive back like her you know her groove you know yeah but like for sure. like not like in all seriousness her like actual restlessness you know like the part of her spirit that makes her like um you know I would say an artist but I I don't know what you know compels this woman <laughs> you know <laughs> no my first thought so, would be to like yeah whatever an artist is and you know okay right. so I. It, maybe it sounds better in German. I don't like the phrase so much, but, you know, like Nietzsche has this idea about, um, like, making living into his living's life into an art. He says, he, you know, right with his foot. I guess by I mean, like, the, the trail he walks. Oh, right. I kind of do like that, actually. But I, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I like the, I the heard that visual, before. but I don't know. Something about, like, right with... I just, like, when I, it makes me think of literally writing with your foot, which I think is, like, where it falls <laughs> That's like, fair. I, I guess it doesn't quite communicate it perfectly. I I, I guess I, I guess I know what I but, mean. What he means, and because of that, I find yeah, that, the idea is very strong. Yeah, I, I I think the disconnect, you know, it just makes it like you know, gives you something to chuckle about there. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Um, Any, anyway, mm-hmm. but yeah. So I again, I I don't think like um, you know, I I think this is like about probably divorce in a way, you know, or like about um her realizing that she can't continue her life with this, you know, boorish man who makes roads. Yeah. You know? I mean, it seemed like at least there was cause to go to couples therapy. Besides that, like, she felt like th- that he had, like, all these anxieties about people judging them um, that he would, like, project onto onto her. Like, he thought, like, right. they would judge him because of how she dressed or what she, you know, who she was around. And also, it's kind of weird, I thought, that he never asks her about the sanitarium. Yeah, at the end, when she's looking tired, that's, like, the first thing he does is he, you know, his first thought is, like, oh, the, the so-and-sos will see you and you look tired. <laughs> you yeah. <know? laughs> yeah, that's as far as his concern goes. Yeah, so there's, like, definitely, like, cause for that. And at the end, like, and the idea of, like, I want to be here i guess the implication too is also like spend some time alone it becomes mm-hmm. a big argument i don't know like, it's just, i guess it's just like i guess we read it was only one sentence but i just imagined basically a breakup i guess that's how i described it earlier yeah or at the very least sort of one of those um you know what i mean like they're married so yeah it's just a big fight you know a big fight i mean spend some time apart <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, but yeah, yeah. I think there's definitely a, um, yeah, the story of like finding like whatever drives her, and I I think contrasting with Miss Slater, I I think that was also like a really good point because when she's with Miss Slater, like all she wants to do is talk about London, even though she's afraid she'll never be able to go back. Is just talk about London and do right. Londony things and look at magazines from the outside world. Right. Yeah, like, like, Margaret wants to know more about this world, and Miss Slater's always deflecting with a complaint and wanting to just oh, talk yeah. about, like, her old life, I guess. Right, and I, I actually think she's sort of the key to understanding all of it, and that she is, like, a British woman, and her name is so similar to Margaret's, um, you know? Like, what's Sawyer? Is it Sawyer? It's Sawyer yeah. and Slater, right? Yeah. Yeah. But... Yeah, and, and uh, you know, so because there's like a lot of flowery prose and like language in this, some of like the um, some of the actual meaning that's delivered in a really on the nose way, you kind of like lose track of. Like I remember the Polish, um, you know, general or whatever, um, mm-hmm. 
says something to the effect of like you need to uh what is it you need to go like past yourself you know you need to go like beyond yourself to like understand yourself or something like that and that's like very oh, wow. literal advice for her <laughs> i it, right like does he not say something to that maybe to yeah that effect yeah i can't remember exactly how he puts it it did feel like he was um, like dropping a lot of like a lot of like like strong observations i guess i, I hung up to i hung on to the car thing just because it's a bullshit i've been on but yeah i think like because it is in this you know such a long stream of eccentric language i think another thing that he said too that i i think is interesting is that he doesn't i don't think he ever explicitly tells her to go into the wood he just says like as you can see everyone has their own feelings about it right you know, uh, I guess like the satanic, the 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 Satan thing is, do as thou wilt or whatever. Um, <laughs> right. He's <laughs> like, I don't care either way. <laughs> yeah. So so you know, angel and devil still applies, but also just in the terms of like, he's not there to tell her who to be. I think you can probably see he sneaks in some like whatever normative language. He just has his own perspective, but it seems like a more gentle kind of encouragement. That's like whatever path you want to go on. Right. I'm trying to find the I'm I'm trying to find the page. Yeah, I'm looking I'm looking forward to uh sorry, I'm like reading it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was in the part about where where the boundaries of the the cure houses woods and where the the rest of Sweden's woods began. Yeah, when I remember there's like a oh, lot yeah. a certain fixation on the fact that there's no real boundary. You know what I mean? The, yeah, the woods just something. end where they where the rabbit runs shoot past the rest of themselves and shoot off into the rest of the woods. So you know, theoretically there's no there's no real border. This is how far you're wanting to you're willing to go right he talks about some people never coming back or something when oh, yeah, i think that's what it is what he's talking about the people not coming back once they pass some kind of limit this one like everyone right. everyone has their limit i think he compares it to nirvana as well yeah but that, that's something right. no european can ever understand do you think do you think that when they wander past the boundaries of the woods they sort of just find their way back to everything else I mean, that would kind of make sense, right? That's what she implies at the end, kind of. Like, once I'm out, I'll let Yeah, you and I, I, I think that kind of, like, follows, if that makes sense. Like, I, I think this is um, largely... Like, insomnia here is, like, the, the personal journey that, like, is just, like, a part of existence. And, like, the need to, um, you know, to, to live it, right? Yeah, I, like, I need to live it as opposed to, like, sleep through it, I guess. Right, repress it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in a way, these people in the woods are are really the only ones who are awake and that they're, you know, in the process of, like, actualizing. And, and once that's been completed, then, then their place in society is, you know, sort of earned. It's theirs. Yeah, I mean, and, 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 you know, there's some, you know, there's the talk about, like, uh, modernization, kind of, like, taking things away, things being like they should be more convenient, but still, like, taking up all your time and attention anyways. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, and there's me something about the, the decline Roomba. of... Me with the damn Roomba. Right. The damn Roomba. <laughs> yeah, I know. Gotta be cleaned every ten, ten fucking minutes. <laughs> uh, that's funny, yeah. So it's cleaning hard. They gotta clean it all the time. Right, um, yeah. Uh, like, with like with the decline of that sanitarium, of how, it, I guess, it used to be more popular. Like, Miss Later is, like, so impressed to see someone new. And then she says, oh, a casual, that ha we haven't had that in so long. Or like, I guess it's with the times. Like, it seems like uh, like it had been a development over time that maybe the relationship between um, sleepers and the insomniacs was more, um, I don't know, more porous or more uh, friendly. And over time, right. uh, like, it's you're either a normal sleeping person or you're shunted off like to the you know top of a mountain <laughs> right and also i guess like part of the condition is also like needing to be alone and seeing something through yourself also but at least like there seemed to be like more connection like i do you think that when everyone's rude it's because they can tell that a change happened i don't know if they said explicitly i don't know how 
I'm just like bounce off of this idea, but like when she's back in town and all the hotels are rude to her, and like everyone can tell how tired she is, and all the Swedes are like l- giving her looks and stuff. Like, do you think it's because they can tell? Like, I think they say that like in Sweden, it happens more, and since it's a smaller population, people become more aware of it. I wonder that, or somehow they they knew where the taxi was coming from. So they just, like, heard about, like, oh, we got someone fraternizing with the insomniacs. Right. I think it's, yeah. Again, I just took it to mean that her purpose there wasn't, fin- you know, fulfilled. I, I... Mm-hmm. <clears throat> She's got to go for a walk in those woods dressed in her special outfit. That's what she <laughs> yeah. means. No, I, like, I'm serious, though. I, I think that's, like, what it is. I, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. She needs, she likes the version of herself that is the woodland hiker, you know, and I think she needs to see yeah. that archetype through. You know, I right, think that I for her is the, you know, that's the, that's the thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like not dress for, um, like society. your husband's gay society. It's, it feels so weird. Like saying the lessons advice you'd hear all the time, you know, like don't dress for them just for you. Like, oh, right. but it hits yeah, yeah, like yeah, someone yeah. stronger for some reason in this, like in this way. Well, because you can see the relationship, you know what I mean? Like, like this is something that's held her back, you know, in terms of herself, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, y- you know, usually when that's said, it's just like, uh, you know, it's like some girl is wearing too much makeup by her own free <laughs> choice, you know? And they're like, hey, hey, you're beautiful no matter how much makeup you wear, <laughs> you know? And, but she chose to do that, so it's a moot point, you know? But in this mm-hmm. case... This person is, you know, is, is, is sort of like living a life that's, that they're not truthfully suited to, you know, mm-hmm. and that, that becomes evident, you know, as we explore their character. Yeah. I, comp- I, I, I call it as a joke of uh, coming out as an insomniac when she's talking to, <laughs> right. to us, but honestly, like uh, you could like that reading is yeah, there for yeah. sure. And all, like, yeah, the- there's parallels there, I think. One of the, like, there's two books, too. When she arrives at the core house, there's one presumably about insomnia, and there's another one that's Sappho by Daudet. Oh, Maybe... my God. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm just going off the title. I don't, I have no idea if this particular publication is what the title Sappho makes me think, but it makes me think it more. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess what I've noticed about, about um, you know, I, I guess having only read this Aikman, I can't say about Aikman, but about, you know, what, what the writing in this story is that sometimes you are fed things very directly. You just don't know you're being fed them directly because mm. of all the, you know, all, all of the other fluff anyway, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great, um, it's a great strategy. Of just like yeah, throwing like all this stuff and let it like just sink in on its own. Right, right. Like somewhere amid all this Swedish words for scrambled eggs and like, you know, like <laughs> dense, dense references to things that I haven't read and don't know how to look up. You know, there, there's things that are just very straightforward, like almost too straightforward, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I I'm going to take the lesbo. Like sleight of hand. Right. Yeah. I, I'm going to take the lesbo thing as canon. I, 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 I <laughs> Sappho, sorry. Hey, you know, what's a, you oh. know, it's all the same. <laughs> <laughs> Lesbo, Sappho, what do you... What do you, what do you right, you know, yeah, yeah. So that's the island she's from, right? Right, yeah, right. That young girl, the young woman who... With the pale blue eyes. What does she add to the story besides just being being there? Yeah, I had some thoughts on that. I, I think for me, it's... Um, you know, so like... Being a woman, it's like... You know, aging is scary, you know? Mm. And I think that, like, um, in sort of, like, in so much as, like, this, uh, the characters in this uh, car, car house represent, like, um, you know, the, the the theater of her head, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, I think that's, like, um, you know, like, like, kind of her youth poking at her, you know what I mean? Because oh. it's, like, alluded to a couple times that she's beautiful, you know what I mean? She wears these skin tight clothes in spite of the fact that she's, you know, doesn't have a very full figure yet, you know, or whatever it is. Uh, at one point, she's just sitting there kind of lounging about, you know, and it's commented that in spite of her beauty, the men don't approach or whatever. 
And I, I think that, like, would tie in a bit to, like, the themes of, like, you know, aging and actualization and, like, you know, her discontentedness and oh, yeah. the life she finds herself in. But I, I, I that's just, like, that, that's, like, what I was thinking. I, I, I can't, like, I, I don't know if there's, like, enough there for me to be, like, this is this is that, you know, but that's, that's yeah, kind of I think it it's Yeah, I think it's peppered in, like, it's just lightly on top of it enough that it, like, it could just, like you know, like, just sort of uh, um, garnish, like, whatever reaction you might have to it. Yeah, yeah, and, like, I, I think tying back to the clothes thing, like, it's telling that this woman is able to go outside in, like, skin-tight clothing, you know what I mean? Yeah. This, this dress or whatever, whereas, um, y- you know, for, our, for our, our, our Margaret or whatever, or Molly or whatever her name is, she needs the, um, you know what I mean, she needs to be, mm-hmm. like, equipped you know right and it's and she, like she does like even compare like how did that woman like how did she manage like with what she was wearing she seems like she well, was super comfortable i and i wonder like how we're supposed to take that i mean i, I like if, if we're following like my version of that to like it's it's end point you know what i mean like you could just say that her needs have changed over time you know like the version of her that did wear pretty um you know dresses mm-hmm. in the in the in the uk um you know, just had, like, maybe different needs or, like, uh, was in some way just more prepared for the life that, you know, was occurring at that point. Yeah, yeah. Just like maybe, I'm wearing yeah. a pretty dress right now. Oh. Anyway, that's all. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> and that's, like, what helped, uh, yeah, that, that's part of, right. um, that's, that's what you, your equipment to go into the wood. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I'm remembering now a scene where, like, when she gets, is it, I think it's before she's about to go out into the wood, that she gets naked and thinks to herself that she hasn't enjoyed her silhouette in a, so much in a long time. Well, right, and that's because she's feeling, I think, that, you know, that, that, that tease of, you know, you know, becoming her, her ideal self. Mm-hmm. you know she can see it she can it's, it's close you know yeah it's close at hand yeah yeah i, I guess like yeah i think we like we kind of got it so it's like it's hard to like thing and then like we're getting to the point where like talking around it is a little bit just like adding you know putting words on yeah everything everything is just conforming to our interpretation of it at this point <laughs> <laughs> well all right i mean i corbin you got anything else or if we have we sort of you know, cook this poppy. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's, it's cooked. Yeah. Got a nice grill mark on there. It's hard. I don't want to say good. I, I, I really love this guy's, this guy's writing. It is such a trip to read the story. You know, what was interesting for me was I, like I, I mentioned just sort of as a sidebar, I, I, you know, that I was Googling a lot of shit, you know, just to find out the things were like scrambled eggs and that, like, you know uh-huh. what I mean? Or like red cabbage. But one thing that I did was, um, so, you know, other than like locations that, you know, in this story, like, you know, like, uh, like, like cities Back that home? you've heard of in real life. Yeah. Like that. Uh, everything's fictional. Everything's fictional. Like, oh. like, the lake he describes doesn't exist, you know, this, the town doesn't exist, you know, like, the, oh. just not real places. Speaking and of, there, I guess, like, oh, sorry, uh-huh. Uh, I was going to say, there are some pretty big lakes in Sweden, but, you know, th- there's actually a shitload of lakes in Sweden, like, so many, right? But the one, none of the biggest ones have that name, so that, <laughs> you know, and that was the, the way it's described in the story is one of the biggest, so... Yeah, they say it's one of the biggest lakes, and there's a cool description when she's driving, when they're driving in the mountain, and she's looking down at the lake, the way she describes, because, oh, oh, okay, so we're talking, like, a lot about, like, discovering, like, yourself, but there's also this thing about mystery. Right. Um, Because, like, part of what she sees when she's in town is... Um, like the museums and stuff, and they say it's called Lake Orm because and it's named after a snake. And they said that at first it was named after a snake that was in there, and how mm-hmm. the depictions of the snake, um, y- you know, changed with the you know with the culture. Right. And sometimes it wasn't even a depiction of a snake, but a depict, but just the horrible machine that they intended to catch the snake with. <laughs> uh, right. 
Um, but then she read somewhere that um, that it wasn't named after the snake that was in it, but the name is because of the lake itself, which is snake-like. Oh. Because huh. it is twists and turns. And, you know, she's looking up at it, and she doesn't describe it as a snake. She describes it as more of an octopus. Like, she talks about their lake, like, kind of, like, having these long tendrils that would go around the town and stuff. Right. Which I think is, like, a very evocative image. But I think there's something there to, like, people's relationship to, to mystery. They look at this lake as this thing that's hiding a mystery. And at some point, it's an antagonistic relationship with that mystery. Or, um, you know, a darkly obsessive one, at least. Um, yeah, well, I think some of that is her relationship with the woods, too, you know? Yeah. Yeah, they're alluring and they're scary and... Right, because what would compel a sane woman to walk through the cold woods at night anyway, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's got to be some kind of... Some kind of cause. Probably, you know, and like the answer, of course, is that it's... Uh, it's not something about the woods, but something about herself. Like, she's someone who needs... A woods to go out into right free from her shithead um, husband yeah on the subject of sweden i really want a blahage you know from ikea a what a blahage what's that it sounds like Googly what borat porn. would call a blowjob <laughs> right it is <laughs> no oh wait okay so on the subject of borat there's this like apocryphal <laughs> uh gospel right it's like a shred of like a, um, oh. you know, like a... Okay, I know. Yeah, like, do you know what I'm about to say? All right, yeah, all right. No. Mm-hmm. So it's called the Gospel of Jesus' Wife, right? And they call it that because it's such a fragment that there's no reason to call it anything else. And it literally just goes, and Jesus said to them, my wife, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and that's like, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus does Borat. <laughs> That's so funny because, like, the theological implication of Jesus' and wife is such a big deal, but be- because of Dude, how... Dude, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, fuck that. My wife. Yeah, my wife. <laughs> right. Speaking anyway, of how yeah, the modern no. world has, like, turned mysteries into... <laughs> in right, banality. yeah, no, but you're right, though. It, 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 there's, of course, there's a pretty serious implication to, you know, Jesus having a, a but... wife of any kind, but... <laughs> More importantly, more impo- I would say more importantly, my wife. <laughs> right, more importantly, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> See, why do I think that's so funny? I, I never did watch the second Borat movie because it's like Amazon paywalled the fuck, you know? Oh, yeah, but yeah. I, I, would, I would love that's to good. see that somehow, some way. Uh, well, yeah, yeah I mean, they, they got Rudy Giuliani committing sexual assaults. I mean, I, I, I live for it. I'm, I'm here... Yeah, just 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 shy, but pretty much. Just shy, just shy. Yeah, just shy. Maybe oh. edit that out so that we don't get sued by him. He was just adjusting his zipper, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said. That was his excuse later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess like um, yeah, we cooked it. I guess with the um, but that was interesting with the with the lake. Also, like the description of the, of the town. Like they talk about like it has these urban, um these urban comforts but right but it's like a lot of stone and Mm -hmm. yeah you know i i I didn't i don't want this to make it into the final cut but are are you aware of kind of like the meme about swedish hospitality oh the what it came out read the the thing about how they actually won't feed their guests yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I was reading this, and like they make a couple mentions to it in the beginning of how they're oh so generous in that, you know, uh, you know, in the context of business. But then like later on, she talks about it again, you know, when she's become the insomniac, and the, you know they can all see that on her, or whatever. But she's like, oh, the the Swedes aren't so hospitable after all. And I just I kept <laughs> thinking about that, that that mythological. You know, I don't even know if that's true or not. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I just like, but I just kept thinking of that. Yeah, that it's poss- it's possible that it's just like that you just whatever Scandinavia the Scandinavian block is just you know out you know far away enough that their mores are just more confusing. 
Yeah, I was gonna say, like, I, you know, on the record, I would say that it does seem like the cultural differences between, like, you know, Scandinavians and typical Europeans is sort of like a sub theme here, because that comes up like a number of times in a number of contexts. And I'm not really like well educated enough on that to like posit any kind of interpretation based on that, but it's definitely something I noticed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Like, it sometimes it's just used as a way for um, Margaret to sort of lampshade things that are weird. To go, oh, maybe yeah. just because that's how the Continentals Damn, do it, or that's how the Swedes sweet, do it. So. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, but also, like, I, I don't know if it's felt more... I guess it's, like, all over Europe, too. There's just the... There's also... I mean, I, okay, this part specifically when I say, oh, Swedes actually see this more, right? So there is, like... he Aikman does um, decide to give Sweden certain uh, benefits... Uh, like, but that early paragraph where he talks about like um, how maybe these holy places were more acknowledged in paganism. Oh yeah. Um, there is something Ooh. interesting with Christianity's religion to Europe. I mean, relationship to Europe, in that like right. it's all these pe like Christianity was like the great unifier, right? Like people would talk about Christendom before they would talk about a a concept of a Europe. Mm -hmm under that facade are you know all these little differences for sweden and norway that would have been a much later development i think that would make sense so it's only lightly hinted at in the story like this aspect of um yeah yeah at least modern christianity kind of uh, uh what's the word like i don't know um bringing down the heat on on these cultural uh you know on these cultural right. forces well, and I think it's interesting that they choose Sweden as the setting in that light because it was Christianized so late and there is so much of, in the Scandinavian countries, that, like, cultural connection with the pagan root, you know? Mm -hmm. um, at least, you know, if you believe what's this fuck <laughs> Varg or whatever. Uh, yeah. That guy. Right, yeah, yeah, no, I know that famously it's uh, um, a lot of the wrong people, like, <laughs> right. have a yeah, lot of opinions yeah. about... That's part of what's got me also, like, kind of holding my tongue a little bit and not wanting to to explore it too deeply because <laughs> i love talking about things i don't know about anyways <laughs> uh yeah sorry yeah but like uh, um sorry yeah i think we we already cooked the we already said as i said we already cooked it, it this puppy this little baby dog it's getting burnt to a crisp it, it was <laughs> medium rare but now it's well done <laughs> this little baby dog that we've been cooking I, we are, we know what we're reading next, right? So I guess we can announce it now. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, it's we're gonna do some yeah we're gonna do some Tolkien. Uh, something less well known, the tale of Tenuvial. Is that am I pronouncing that right, Corey? I I believe so. I've never heard it pronounced out loud. That's how. All right. That's how old and, and distant it is from Tolkien writing that's usually explored in, in the mainstream. Even though it's always referenced in, like, every elf-human relationship. I'm glad you added in these movies. I was like, when I'm with my elf boyfriend, he never mentions it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I let him go off, but it's just to help me go to sleep. <laughs> it's fun it's uh, cool there's there's a giant evil cat and it's, i like it yeah yeah sauron is a sauron is a cat and this is my understanding so that should be interesting it should be interesting um i feel like i'm i'm i i, <laughs> I want to throw in um if you like this story by robert aikman this is uh just out there um if you want to give the the hospice a read um, just a recommendation. It's kind of like the dark side of this story. Oh, okay. Like, what if a what if a hotel was act was bad and mean to you? <laughs> like, aren't they already? <laughs> oh, anyway. I, yeah, I guess so. I did like I did like Aikman though. I I feel like even we could you know maybe there will be another like an Aikman revisited some somewhere oh, down the yeah. road. Yeah, we gotta go back to Aikman. Probably Legati could be worth revisiting too. 
I was thinking that. I mean, I not that our first episode was bad, but I, I feel like it could be revisited now mm. that we have our, you know, now that we've cut our teeth a bit. So yeah, uh, yeah, just a short little thing. Uh, if you, you know, for anyone listening, if this episode's got you interested in more Aikman, um, like he hasn't, he didn't, he didn't publish much in his career, um, but the Hospice is a really good one to check out next if you like um, hospitality. Uh, centered stories <laughs> <laughs> I really like the thing where it was a bed that wasn't the one in their house you have anything more like that yeah I do it's the hospice <laughs> check it out I really like a good I really like when a story is centered around a hotel you know <laughs> The Shining um, uh, Chelsea Girls by Nico I, anything, <laughs> anything focused around a hotel really gets me <laughs> i've <clears throat> i've dipped into you know sweet life zach and, Co- and on sweet deck <laughs> although you know purists don't like to include on deck in the ho- in the hotel canon but you know it counts that's foolish that's <laughs> foolish to me and here's why a a cruise ship is a hotel at sea <laughs> it's a floating prison. oh here you go with the hotel at sea stuff again now this is become a three hour episode because we're gonna have to hash this out <laughs> it's <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, like comment subscribe any <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah uh as always this has been pleasant evenings book club the podcast we have had a great time bringing you uh roger no robert <laughs> aikman's but as we covered, uh, that's the into... same thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think, same name. I uh, think. John it's, Aikman. It's Ivan uh, Aikman's <laughs> uh, Into the Woods. is a phenomenal read. And uh, don't uh, go wandering at night in the woods. Unless you want to. All right. And without <laughs> further ado, have a pleasant evening. All right. That's after this. All right. I'll see you. <laughs> That's the thing. Stop. No, you didn't stop. <laughs>